my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Tony Hodgson. Tony, like a number of other speakers in this series and in previous series, is a fellow of the International Futures Forum, so I know him well. Uh, I have known and worked with him for over a decade now. And I was thinking back, I first met him at an international conference of the Society for Organizational Learning uh, in Bordeaux, which must be 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, this was the first organizational, the Society for Organizational Learning conference that they held in Europe. So all the dignitaries and the luminaries of uh, organizational learning and systems thinking have flown over from the States, especially um, for this occasion. And I saw you know, all kinds of people like Peter Senge and others, uh, people that I've read about and had the privilege to meet. Also met this other gentleman named uh, Tony Hodgson, who was obviously well respected and revered in this community as somebody who had a long uh, background and experience in corporate consulting and strategy work uh, and a strong theoretical uh, grounding in systems thinking, cybernetics, viable systems and all kinds of other things, um, arcane subjects that I knew nothing of then and know a little of now. Um, the remarkable thing about this gentleman was that he didn't come from the United States but from Pitt Lockery. Uh, and so I latched onto him and followed up this connection once I got back to Scotland uh, and have stayed in touch and worked closely with Tony ever since. Uh, and what I've noticed is that that patina of what looked to me like very deep knowledge at that time about systems thinking and cybernetics was less than the half of it. Uh, and over the years, uh, he slowly revealed uh, more and more layers of knowledge and learning and wisdom uh, to me and to others. Uh, and I think the reason why he's able to do that is because he is a learner himself, uh, petually curious, always interested in the next thing, uh, and the next thing that he needs to learn in order to be, be more effective in the world. Um, another thing that I discovered about Tony was that uh, we sh shared an interest in learning and in education, uh, and at that time I was running the Scottish Council Foundation with a big programme on education and the future of Scottish schooling, it turned out that Tony had run for a number of years an experimental school for his own children and the children of other employees in his consultancy, uh, which is another mark of the man that, uh, although I suspect that quite a lot of what we hear this afternoon will see seem deeply theoretical, um, all of this thinking is in the service of more effective <coughs> practice. So this is a man uh, who doesn't only preach to others but takes his own medicine and puts it into practice. Uh, in the lives of himself and his children. And having met them, I can say that uh, I wish my children had been to that experimental school too. Uh, his, his subject tonight is resilience, uh, another subject that you can see would come out of uh, taking a systemic and a practical view of the world. Um, Tony's worked for a long time on issues of sustainability and viability of complex systems. Uh, his world system model, uh, the IFF world model, is the basis for the Understanding Glasgow model that some of you will have seen, understandingglasgow.com, and a holistic set of indicators for understanding what it would take, the very the different aspects and facets of a city um, that need to be viable in order for the whole system to be viable. Uh, he's going to take us, I suspect, several steps further uh, this afternoon. His uh, subject is, is resilience enough? Knowing Tony, I suspect the answer is going to be no, uh, but also knowing Tony, I don't think he's going to leave us hanging there uh, in that ignorance. He will offer us something uh, that is both stimulating, illuminating, and ultimately practical uh, to go home with. So um, I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome Tony Hodgson. Well, thank you, Graham. After a build-up like that, you'd never believe I'm retired, would you? <coughs> but um, I can't stop having hobbies, so I'm very happy to be here to share this one with you. Um, I think we're all aware that um, our society is going through an increasing frequency of shocks and surprises. And some things that maybe happened one at a time are happening two or three at a time. And this creates a very different context in which we can look at planning, uh, development, public health and so on. So the basic um, thing I'd like to share with you is the idea that, uh, as you're probably aware, otherwise you wouldn't be here, the word resilience 
seems to be gradually displacing the word sustainability, which has got a bit jaded. Uh, my concern is that maybe resilience could just become another fashionable word without sufficient content. So I'd like to suggest some of the content that might be contained in it. Um, but the question is, is e even that enough? So the other th uh, thoughts I want to share with you are, are, are about what might be happening in the world and where that's heading. Uh, we do occasionally think about the future in the International Futures Forum and uh, so there are some thoughts summarised in, uh, in what you're about to see. So the topics um, I want to cover are roughly looking at uh, the challenge of this disruptive change, assuming that the water gets a bit rougher. Who's taking it seriously? I mean, is this just a, an academic thing or is it actually a grounded thing with the practical people? What resilience as a concept teaches us? What, what, what might it contribute that helps us to think differently and then maybe do differently? The idea that there are some risks attached to resilience that it might be good to have early warning about. Um, the point that resilience cuts across everything, that it's an interdisciplinary approach. You can't chop organisms up to make them more viable. You have to look at them as a whole. Um, just an example of um, some of the work we've done in IFF to give us tools to actually get a hold of this more complex picture. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, the idea that maybe um, there is um, another sort of resilience to the one that's being generally talked about that might be more useful for us. Um, so what are some of the, the challenges that, that we're seeing here? Well, one of my favourite authors is a guy called Thomas Homer Dixon, who wrote a, has written a very interesting book called The Upside of Down. And one of his um, points is that we're living in a world where these events are happening more and more simultaneously, and we're not set up to cope with that. And he calls it synchronous failure. So our societies won't face one or two major challenges at once. They'll face an alarming variety of problems all at the same time. You will get quite a bit of the bad news at the start of this talk. I'm saving the good news up for later. <laughs> um, another author, uh, uh, The Meaning of the 21st Century, James Martin, who funded and founded the, the James Martin Institute for the Future at Oxford University, looking at the trends, comes to the view that, that they're converging into what he used as a metaphor, the canyon. So here we are floating down the river in our canoe, upright, and more or less keeping the boat from not leaking too much. Although it does seem that there's been rather a lot of um, leakage going on lately. And, um, but ahead is the roar of the canyon. And the question is, can we actually get through that canyon and hope and pray that there's some calmer water on the other side and that canyons don't last forever. So that means that it, by analogy, if in this calmer water that we have at the moment, compared to what we might have, if we haven't practiced our Eskimo roles, uh, we may find that we're floating through the canyon upside down and that's very uncomfortable. And can we even control it? Um, I was at a conference um, a couple of years ago and uh, Raul Aspecho, who's a noted thinker in this field of cybernetics and systems thinking for those who are into it more academically, um, made the statement that um, our response capacity is much constrained compared to the complexity of the world out there. That however much um, neurobiologists go on about the 10 billion neurons in our heads and so there are quite a lot in this room if we add them all together it's still not of the order of complexity of the world that we're dealing with and so there may be a very fundamental issue here that affects 
the way we think about resilience. So these leave our, um, what I call our adaptive capacity, stressed. And so I want to make the case that for all the wonders of the last 50, 100, 150 years in the very technology supported global civilization with a global economy and emerging global culture, we still have built ourselves a very brittle society. Brittle means if it gets a shock, it breaks, it doesn't bend. Um, well, you know, I can mention Icelandic volcanoes just as a quick memory jogger there that it doesn't take a lot to bring things to a standstill. I could even mention snow in Scotland uh, last winter. <laughs> um, you know, that we, we, um, we have a, an interconnected infrastructure. If we look at the fact that almost everything that operates in our, certainly in our developed world, depends on the functioning of the internet, that I'm told by experts in the field that the voltage variation for a stable internet is very, very tiny. And I hear the astronomers talking about um, massive solar storms hitting uh, the, um, the atmosphere and, and putting out our communication systems. And then the sewage pumps go off because we thought it was smart to control them through the internet. So there are all sorts of cases can be made that the infrastructure, which is wonderful if things remain relatively calm, is actually a liability when things crash to pieces. Um, we've made a, a great thing in economy of uh, getting rid of things like inventory, which is a cost, isn't it? So it reduces our profit. And so we get rid of redundancy. You know, if, if anything's duplicated, cut it. I believe that's a, quite a common theme at the moment. <laughs> public services, but redundancy is a property of nature that gives nature the capacity to respond and adapt. So um, as one of the directors of the New Economics Foundation puts it, Andrew Sim, we're only actually nine meals from Armageddon. Now I found that a bit difficult to swallow until one day it rained very heavily and there was a landslide uh, between Pitlochry and Dunkeld no traffic could get up the A A9, where our food comes from mainly, and within two days the um, co-op's um, supermarket shelves were practically empty. <laughs> um, so you know that was just a tiny uh, little signal, a sort of uh, canary in the mine, so to speak, that that disruptions to our infrastructure we're not set up to deal with. We don't have stores and warehouses like we used to. Um, we also put a tremendous expectation on what we call our emergency services. Is there anybody who works in emergency services here? No? Okay. Well, I'd just like to remind you that emergency services are people too. They have frailties, they have families, they have concerns. And yet when something goes awry, we project onto them, it's their responsibility to sort it out. Imagining, or not, not imagining, that they have the same issues that we might have about being snowed in or flooded or whatever. So, um, if, as Thomas Homer Dixon says, we, we're heading for multiple impacts, the idea of an emergency service may be um, useful up to a point, but also out of date. <clears throat> and of course we have a, created a very dependent society where you know, there's always somebody else's job to fix it. <clears throat> um, one of the lessons I learned about adaptability was um, <clears throat> wandering around on pilgrimage in India where I realised the first job I had to do anywhere I stayed was to fix the plumbing. Then I could get a shower. Um, that, that, that in fact we... we, we, we We've created such a dependent situation um, that um, if we haven't got the specialists around, um, we can't deal with um, the, the situation. <coughs> um, 
So there are some risks attached to this that these kinds of disruptions, and I include in this things like the financial crisis, actually um, disrupt a highly interconnected system that sort of falls apart. Um, our just in time becomes right out of stuff, the nine mils to Armageddon. Emergency services become the biggest emergency because um, I remember studying a piece about the big earthquake about 35 years ago, whenever it was in Mexico City, where the, the devastation was so great that there weren't any emergency services, they were taken out. And the most resilient communities were the favelas, where the so-called criminal gangs knew how to organise themselves and deal with stuff. Uh, interesting thought. Um, I've said, mentioned about the, this expectation that it's somebody else's responsibility or fault. And in that situation, we run out of options. And one of the characteristics of resilience is to have options. If, if there's only one thing you can do and that gets upset and you've no plan B or even plan C, then uh, that's not very good. So who's taking this sort of thinking seriously? Well, I'm glad to say that in, in the UK, it's being taken a little bit seriously. Um, there is civil contingency planning. There was a Civil Contingency Act in 2004. And so um, uh, public management has a duty to assess, plan and advise. That's good. Um, keeping some sort of risk register. Uh, examination of those don't see anything more than lists. And lists are not interconnected and they're not synchronous. So there's a worry there. And it's all about helping business. Well, yeah, businesses are important. David Cameron keeps insisting they are. But what about communities? What about civic society? Um, and also, we, you know, there's a lot of public relations when there are disasters and communication. So it's a bit thin. Um, more promising in some ways, although I'm not knocking the civil contingencies, we need that, um, are grassroots movements. How many of you here have come across the transition town movement? A few hands. Um, the idea behind transition towns is simple. If you have no faith that governments will take meaningful action on climate change and peak oil, then you can come together as a community to do something about it. So that all started in Totnes. A guy called Rob Hopkins was one of the key uh, visionaries, movers and shakers, but it's very much a kind of um, a team and network that, that's coming together. And this is catching fire. As people become more aware that issues like peak oil are significant, we've got a long way to go. Um, you know, we complain about the price of fuel as if there wasn't going to be peak oil. So if we're not able to cope with you know, um, a 2p rise, how are we going to cope with a doubling in the price or a quadrupling in the price? Um, so the idea of energy descent is key in the transition movement and it's spreading. If you go on their website now, there are um, local councils in some places have taken it up. There are probably um, two or three hundred towns or communities have taken it up. It's becoming international. And in parallel, in the USA, there's another movement called re relocalization, which is saying that, well, actually, to be resilient, we need to be able to be pretty self-sufficient in, in essentials. It's not that we're cut off or isolated or, or we don't trade, but we actually um, uh, can look after ourselves for a period. Um, so that requires a relocalization. But the general approach to economic development is to bring in the big brands who set up supermarkets and other kinds of um, enterprises where the shareholders are remote and, and they kind of actually vacuum clean the economy. In the transition movement, people are experimenting with local currencies so that the currency keeps circulating. So there's the Totnes Pound and the Findhorn Eco and so on. Um, so that uh, local commerce keep, keep the economy circulating in those things where it's appropriate. 
Obviously, we still are not going to make our own cars locally, but, um, uh, but there are many things like food and services that we can do. Now, believe it or not, big business is taking this. Uh, about a couple of years ago, I, I checked out something called the United States Council on Competitiveness, and it was the usual blue chip uh, suspects. And what they were talking about was, um, it's undeniable that the world has gotten more risky. Businesses now function in a global economy characterized by increasing uncertainty, complexity, connectivity, and speed. A challenge that demands resilience, the capability to survive, adapt, evolve, and grow in the face of change. So this is being taken seriously at, at quite high levels. Of course, it's resilience in the service of protecting shareholder value, not necessarily communities. And some of this arose out of fear of terrorism, which is another factor in the um, possible synchronous failures. But there it is. It means that resources are going into thinking about this uh, that we might not normally know about. But we're uh, also here interested in our city, Glasgow. And um, it's interesting to note that uh, some of the Asian city authorities have got together and saying, look, this climate change really could be a threat to our business as usual. So we better start thinking about this, forming a resilience network, which aims to catalyze attention, funding, and action on building climate change resilience for poor and vulnerable people by creating robust models and methodologies for assessing and addressing risk through active engagement and analysis of various cities. So there's a whole kind of beginning of a comparative investigation of those kinds of issues. And of course, um, some of the work that's going on here around um, beginning to look at um, indicators and so on is, is definitely a kind of setting a pattern that would make that kind of collaboration uh, more, more productive. Well, so um, we can take it seriously, but the next thing we need to look at is there are certain fundamental problems we have, which if we don't address them, we risk getting into the superficial treatment of resilience. So the first one is that we organize our society by functional hierarchies, command and control, and if things are too complicated, we divide them up and dish out the responsibility. We've done it for hundreds of years, and it's worked pretty well on the whole. We've even, even run empires that way. But in this new complex era that's emerging, functional hierarchies are becoming increasingly dysfunctional hierarchies. We need something else. And you can see that the emergence of social networks is one of the kind of re reactions to that. Um, we set up monocultures, you know, biggest is best, standardize everything, one size fits all. Okay, so we've got mass customization with modern technology, but it's still, you know, one iPod fits all. Um, at least that's what uh, Steve Jobs would like. Um, we've got economic models which um, are rather like those cartoons of the... Um, you know, the Pink Panther, I don't know. I certainly, maybe I'm a bit older, but I, I remember uh, Pink Panther. You know, he, he's got this ladder, and it's great. You know, so he's, he's going up the ladder, and it's so great, he just keeps on going, but there's no ladder. But he keeps going just long enough to realise that there's nothing there, and then he falls to the ground and gets squished. Uh, and I think our economic models are a bit Pink Pantherish in that respect. Um, <laughs> We keep on saying the answer to everything is growth, but that assumes an infinite ladder. And uh, there are people I've come across who call that mindset the new flat earthers. It works if you have infinite dimensions in, in, in up, down and sideways, but if you're on a sphere, <laughs> it doesn't work. 
So there's something flat earthish about our economy, even though geographically we've, 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 we've got that one sorted out. We've got to the spherical thinking. We haven't got to spherical thinking in our economy. Um, inappropriate infrastructure. Well, I've laboured this quite a bit that um, there's some interesting research going on in America around the idea of self-healing electrical systems. So that if you get um, uh, a massive disruption of the grid, that in a region it's designed in such a way that that region can look after itself for, say, three months. And if in that region that gets disrupted, in the local area that can look after itself for, say, two weeks. So instead of everything going down flat, like we've seen in North America, um, for example, with the big brownout, you can actually conceive of systems that have that resilience built into them. But it's so different from the way we normally do things like electricity grids. And we, we plan to spend billions in refreshing the grid, and we haven't thought about this fundamental issue. Um, and we're stuck in a pattern, that's more of to do with our psychology, that um, you know, we, we get used to the habits of thought that we have and the habits of action and the habits of feeling, and, uh, and that stuckness prevents us from experimenting with, with alternatives that can give us a plan B or a plan C. So, I've been doing some work on climate change recently for about a year for, on a government project, and um, it's siloed. You, you get the scientists doing one set of things, the policy makers at the poli political end doing something else, and then the people adding up the numbers doing something else. And the, 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 the communication is really difficult. Um, and of course part of that is the way that power has been exercised for ever since the invention of the university really was to divide and conquer the brain. You know, divide and conquer is a military strategy that works very well physically, but we've, we've entered a new era now, and we've, we've, we've not caught up with the fact that we've had our brains divided and conquered. And so it's very hard to get local resilience if we're stuck in these silos. Um, so we've got some educational challenges there. But I remember, as a young man, I was very interested in... Uh, university education because I was going through one and I didn't like it and I came across um, uh, a guy called Lord Lindsay who helped to found Keele University and there's one staying, saying since then um, has stuck with me ever since the Lord in his wisdom did not divide the universe into faculties <laughs> uh, so what we're trying to find out, if, if not the Lord's wisdom, at least the universe's wisdom in the way that, that systems work. So, a friend of mine, um, actually he's a sort of distant relative, is an architect in uh, north of England city, working in the uh, sustainable development design area, and he reached a point of frustration um, four or five years ago, and I'm afraid the slide doesn't come up too strongly, but here you've got city de design fragmented. Um, you've got architects, developers, planners, highways, all pulling in different directions. And uh, no multidisciplinary working. It's locked into the silos. So that was his city planning as usual. Whereas here, we've got the idea of, well, if there was a way of aligning these different forces and interests, and we had a way of pulling that together, um, then um, we could perhaps have a more effective way of approaching um, city design. And um, I'm doing some exploratory work with the University of Manchester's um, uh, department or Centre for Urban Ecology. Urban Ecology, now there, there's an interesting interdisciplinary title. <laughs> um, it actually exists and uh, director Joe Rovetz has written a very good book called City 2020 and he's updating it to 2050 now I think. Um, I mentioned the monoculture thing. This is a picture of a palm oil plantation in Malaysia. Used to be rainforest. 
So what's that doing to the biological environment? Well, it's removing diversity and variety. The number of species of plant and insect and animal life in a rainforest is fantastic. We, we don't even know what it is yet. We're discovering new things all the time. In a palm oil plantation, it's pretty fixed. Um, we try and reduce the variability so we can control it. We've got to be in charge because it's economic and we need the palm oil for uh, biofuels. Do we? Another question. Um, we centralise and homogenise things. Um, we get rid of any duplication, which actually, of course, might be our reserve for flexibility. And we pursue the economics of scale. I mean, we, so if we convert the whole of Borneo into palm oil plantations, wouldn't that be great? And, uh, well, they're working on it. Um, now a bit of technical stuff. I'm going to hit you with about three technical ideas, so bear with me. It's not that hard. This is something I got from Bernard Later, who's um, something of a, uh, a guru on uh, currency and alternative currencies. But he points out that uh, here's the curve of our current economy, and we pushed it to be pretty much centred towards throughput efficiency. Hence things like just-in-time, and um, scale and so on. And um, what this means is that, that throughput efficiency appears to be polar with rebound capacity. In other words, if you um, want higher rebound capacity, you've got to sacrifice some efficiency. So how you measure things is very critical. If all you measure is efficiency, I can guarantee you will end up with brittleness. OK, so that a resilient society, as, as, the tur as the increasing turbulence and shocks go along here, you need to move from here to here. Or we need to move from here to here. But this is a centre of gravity. It's like the whole thing revolves around this. So that we have a real problem of how we get to here, from here to here. So that's expressed in this um, <coughs> little drawing, um, which I make no apology for taking from complexity science. Um, we need to learn some of these new ideas. Um, the idea is that imagine this is an energy map. So this is high energy, lower energy, high energy, low, higher energy. And we're living in this particular valley um, and we get a shock that pushes us out of our equilibrium position and the general energy is to get back to normal. So we, with whichever slope we're on, we, 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 we slide down it. Perhaps if the um, environment is more turbulent, if we're going through that canyon that James Martin points out, um, we actually would do better if we were balanced up here. We've got more Eskimo roles, so to speak. And therefore, we need to get from the red circle to the green circle. But there's a barrier, there's an energy barrier. And that, in economic terms, is additional investment, but it's also social investment. But the bonus we get is that we can actually live at a higher level of elasticity or resilience. Um, so, our first resilient step is to recover, you know, let's get back to normal so things function. Maybe adapt, which is saying, well, we've learnt something from all that snow falling, and part of adaptation is, um, from the previous winter, is we got more salt. <laughs> so we actually bought more salt than we needed, which is not economic, but it is resilient. <laughs> okay. But the, the next step is transform, that can we actually transform from this situation to that one? And that's where there's this barrier. So it isn't so easy to, to, to make that step. So that's the problem of stuckness. So is there any new kind of thinking we can do that would help us 
get oriented towards this new kind of environment that we're going to be living and working in. Well, there is a field emerging called resilience thinking. It's coming mainly out of ecology, but it's also increasingly coming out of um, what we might call social ecology. In other words, societies and ecologies together. Um, one of the interesting institutions in Europe is the Stockholm Resilience Institute, which is doing research on this, um, which I'll show you something of a bit later on. But a lot of this comes from um, an Australian, Brian Walker, who's actually published a book called Resilience Thinking. And if you're into this kind of stuff, it's a good read, it's not too technical. And he goes through case studies of how, for example, the Murray Delta area in Australia is right on the edge of collapse, and yet it's the main productive cattle region of Australia. Now, of course, we've had the Queensland disaster, which has taken out a whole agricultural system out, and bouncing back from that is going to be quite uh, an expensive and time-consuming and heavy on human suffering. So what are the ingredients of resilience thinking? Well, the first thing is to try and get out of this silo mentality, to reintegrate our brains and our, in and our way of working together, that we're actually taking whole perspectives. Um, that's difficult if we stick to our analytical way of thinking. So there's something else that our brains are capable of doing that we could call pattern thinking. And in fact, in spatial recognition, if you see the pattern of the room right here, um, that part of your brain that sees patterns is operating. Why don't we use it for thinking? So it gets us into things like visual thinking. But it's also a feel. Do we have a feel? You know, is, is a cat an assemblage of atoms mewing, or is it actually a critter that has a kind of uh, a, a whole being of its own that we appreciate? Um, Without getting too technical, the idea of feedback is important, that um, effects can be causes. Now, it's really easy if... In the, you remember the days when we used to have bank accounts that attracted interest? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's a, a feedback loop where if you don't spend it, it, it accrues. And if you look at the exponential curve, and at my age, over 70, you think, God, if only I'd started saving a little bit when I was 25, I'd be doing all right now, just leaving it in the bank, even with the interest rates as they were. Um, so those dynamic feedback loops are obviously a, a, a very important in, in regulation, but one of the important things about feedback loops is that, for example, they can run away. So a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, gradually building up, <coughs> suddenly goes off scale. <coughs> a good example from climate change is that um, global warming takes place, say, particularly more pronounced in Arctic areas. That begins to melt the tundra. Locked up in the tundra a vast amounts of methane, CH4, Methane is a gas which is 20 times more greenhousey than carbon dioxide that we're making all the fuss about. So the more it warms up, the more methane goes into the atmosphere, the more it warms up, the more it releases into the atmosphere. And so some scientists are saying, hey, watch out, we could actually get a, a, a complete acceleration of global warming if we get to the point where all the methane comes off. May or may not happen, but that's the idea that if we think in a linear way, we'll never, we'll never see that. The other thing about feedback loops is that they push back. <coughs> Have you ever tried to change somebody else's mind? <laughs> you, know, <coughs> you know what pushback is then. That our, our mental system has feedback loops in it that say, no, we're just going to keep playing you know, the tunes we've got. And so unless we can actually rewire the feedback, we can't actually change our minds. So these, these work on, on many, many levels. Um, I made the point about monoculture. 
Another thing that comes out of um, biology and um, cybernetics is something that you've probably never heard of. If you have, that's great. It's called the law of requisite variety. Anyone come across that? Oh, great. Well, you've heard it the first time then. The law of requisite variety says if you have a very complex system out here and you want in some way to guide it or <coughs> govern it, then the complexity of your governance system has to in some way match the complexity of the system you're dealing with. Now if you think about it, that doesn't work in a functional hierarchy because what we do is we appoint a chief executive and blame him for everything or her for everything. But that one brain can't handle it all, even if they're a genius. And so you've got this cult of the hero CEO, say, in America, which is a complete nonsense in terms of the way things really work. So the way Stafford Beer, one of the originators of this kind of work, put it was, if you really wanted requisite variety in your police force, you would have to have one policeman for each person. You know, now, clearly, um, even the most um, uh, surveillance societies didn't quite go that far, but you can see that if, if you've got a Stasi that's watching everybody because everybody's recruited into it, you get a very locked-up system, so you can control it. Um, but the other side of the coin is, if you want a really positive result, you have to have a richness and diversity. And so, um, uh, having... Um, a wide variety of interests and stakeholders and um, ways of looking at things. Um, although it's messy and may appear to be, obviously is a bit difficult to guide and, and, and manage, is actually more likely to have the capacity to respond to um, shocks and surprises. And there's some research that shows that companies that marginalised innovation and mavericks don't do well when the shocks hit. Whereas those that have got skunk works and um, tolerating what uh, some people call um, um, credible heretics or positive deviants actually do better because they've got more plan B, plan C capacity available. Put another way, you never know when something odd might come in useful. Um, the other thing that we need is, is to recognise that we've, we've entered an era of one planet living and that isn't just something from James Lovelock and Guyan thinking and so on. It, it's um, Civilizations used to collapse and it didn't matter because they collapsed on a particular continent and on another continent a civilization didn't collapse. But we're now reaching the point where we're heading for possible collapse of the entire Inshallah, as they say in America. Um, and so we've got a different situation. We don't have a planet B <laughs> that's doing okay if planet A doesn't do well. So this move towards one planet living, however we look at it, is going to be critical in, in resilience. There's no such thing as being alone anymore. Um, of course, the other thing that we can get carried away with is with all these theories and ideas is that we forget people. It's us actually who are the beings who need to be resilient. And so that also raises things about um, our relationships, our mutual understanding <coughs> and our own self-development. So resilience thinking, you can see, is, is, is highly um, interdisciplinary. Now another thing in resilience thinking is that it doesn't go in straight lines. We all like to have things in straight lines. We all like them preferably to go up to the top right hand corner of the graph paper. Um, but in um, resilience thinking there's a view emerged which is called panarchy. A guy called Buzz Holling developed this. It's like anarchy with a bit of purpose behind it. <laughs> okay, it's a good way to remember it. Panarchy. And this figure of eight is like a pathway of a living system. 
So for example, here you've got a, a young forest with saplings that is able to exploit a fertile environment and it grows. But as it grows, it, it, it becomes constrained as one particular kind of uh, spruce forest or whatever it is. Um, for that forest to regenerate, curiously enough, it needs to catch fire. It needs to actually disintegrate, whereas fire we think is a bad thing. Well, it is if it, we live next door and it burns our house down. But in terms of nature herself, forest fires are part of the cycle. And that releases a lot of um, material. It also, funnily enough, activates some of the dormant seeds that have been shed from previous generations. And a whole new uh, reorganization of that system develops. And it then reintegrates here, or possibly it goes off somewhere else. So this um, Chinese saying, um, I don't know what you can say in Mandarin for me, Graham, but, um, you know, crisis is opportunity. <coughs> that if, if, you, if we want to get through that energy barrier from one of the previous slides, we have to recognise we will have to go through crises in a particular way. We put so much energy into avoiding them, usually, that we just bring them on in a different, unproductive way, um, more, more strongly. Um, so the opportunity for redesign, um, if our business as usual setup doesn't work, is between here and here. Now, isn't it interesting, if you look at how the bad guys managed empires, and frankly still do, what do they do? Well, they invent things called shock and awe, and they bomb the hell out of you, and when you're all in pieces, they insert the new, quote, democracy, unquote. <laughs> um, and that's been going on for a long time, but we, we don't actually, they have a plan B, which is what they're going to do after the mayhem. Um, we, we don't, oops, uh, we, um, we don't have anything ready here that would enable us to perhaps propel to a different figure of eight up here. So part of the problem of resilience thinking is investing the time, energy, mental and monetary resources in preparing to transcend the crisis when it comes and not put all those resources in trying to fend off the crisis. Now you might say that's rather expensive in terms of human suffering, but a major crisis is expensive in human suffering anyway and with intelligent design maybe the crisis can be managed humanely and people looked after so it doesn't have to be necessarily bad it's called kind of reinventing society if you like um, so moving on to um, risk now um, the risk is if we don't look at resilience um, I'll have to read this because uh, it looks great on paper but it's a bit washed out on the screen. In the face of disruption we're trying to get back to normal but we can't because we, we continue with this brittle model and so the more we get into difficulties the more we reinforce the model we've got. You know, we, it, it's much easier to put more resources into what we already know than what we don't. Um, we, we find out that our, we're putting so much burden on our civil contingencies that they get overwhelmed, that um, the alternative is the imposition of in effect a police state, um, but that can't deliver either as we've seen historically around the world, at least only on a temporary basis. And the systems which are deeply locked in um, nobody's going to give up their self-interest easily, just keep on perpetuating. But we could deal with that, you know, that would be good policy, good management, um, a more honest society, uh, and a certain amount of uh, mutual compassion, if you like. 
Supposing we succeed at that, we then move into the greater risk. We temporarily succeed in getting back to normal, only to find it quickly fails and leaves us worse off. Well, I mentioned the positive runaway feedback loops, that we've actually perpetuated a situation which was inherently out of control. It was going to sort of run away with itself. Um, there may be discontinuities sudden shocks and surprises that um, we just haven't um, allowed for. Um, we've been close to various kinds of economic collapse and many of the pundits, I don't know whether he Hazel Henderson talked about this, but uh, you know, it could happen again all too easily. Um, and um, it's interesting that our modern technology, like your cell phones, depends on certain transition elements in the periodic table, the source of which is mainly China. And guess what? China is developing its own need for these things and is cutting down on exports. So we have some very dodgy reliances on things that, um, uh, that it's not just oil that's peaking, it's, it's a lot of other things that we depend on. And of course that's all very stressful. You know, it drives you crazy. So, <laughs> um, one of the things you find is that you can't talk about this kind of stuff because people get scared. Well, is it better to get scared a bit early and try and respond positively or just get, you know, really scared when it doesn't hold together? And, you know, the other problem is our human nature. Um, you know, gated communities, um, the guys with the guns get the stuff, uh, all that kind of you know, black scenario stuff. Well, it happens in small ways in our communities. You don't have to have guns for that. So the things that we need to bring to bear uh, are quite wide. I won't bother to read round all those. You'll get the slides if you want them. But um, basically, our problem is how do we draw on the best of these different disciplines and look at it in a holistic way? So, the question is, can we design for transformational resilience? This is the idea that on that panarchy cycle, that figure of eight, we're ready with the next pattern and we can take the opportunity when things are a bit fragmented and confused to actually get the new pattern working with much less pushback. Well, I'm quoting here Buckminster Fuller, a great favourite of mine um, from the previous century. Um, we need a design revolution. This isn't something, and I don't mean any offence to any politicians in the room, but this isn't something that politicians can do. Uh, they may be able to help, but it essentially is, is a design revolution. We need to have much more integrity, and integrity is an interesting word because it means on the one hand integral in the sense of these different disciplines, but it also means integrity in the sense of values and ethics. Um, we've got to have this patterned thinking way of looking at the world rather than um, the analytical thing. Um, we need to realise we don't have the answers, so we need continuous learning. Um, and we've got to try and learn how to operate you know, over the next hundred years within the system we're actually living in. Get out of the flat earth mentality. What are, what are these boundaries? Well, this is from the Stockholm Institute. Um, again, I won't go into the detail here, but this is biodiversity, which we've already blown. <coughs> this is the nitrogen cycle, which we've already blown. This is climate change, which we've slightly blown. <laughs> and these are some other areas which are getting worse, and these are some that we don't know how to measure yet, but they're important. So you can imagine that if the red bits are expanding, we're not doing a very good job. But there are human boundaries too. This is a, a graphic that one of our American IFF members, Bob Horn, drew a while back to say, what the hell's going on out there? Again, if you want to read it, you can look at the slides later. It's just the arrows and the tangly bits that give you the message. And how can we navigate through all that? So what we've um, looked at is what would the elements be of a, of a resilient community? 
And here's a list of really obvious things, and it's very important that they're really obvious. Food, trade, energy, climate, biosphere, water, habitat, wealth, governance and community. Um, there should be worldview in there somewhere as well. And if you join it all together, you get a nice kind of spider's web. Oh, it's right, it's white, that's why. Um, and um, there are 66 links there. Now, IFF was involved some four years ago, was it, in trying to get government departments in Westminster to talk together about the relationship between climate change and energy security. <coughs> Proved impossible. Okay, a few years later, somebody set up a department for climate, energy and climate change, so maybe the message got through eventually, not necessarily from us. But that's the complexity that we're actually dealing with. And um, I'm going to skip this one because uh, we're running out of time and go back over that later. This is the complexity that you're dealing with. <laughs> this is your indicators board. Um, where you can see that anything that could happen in any one of these things could have repercussions on any of the others. They're not all equally connected, but it's quite a challenge to ask the question, if something changes in the poverty profile, what does that do for health? What does it do for transport? How does it affect lifestyle? How is community safety affected? And, and equally. So thinking in the round is actually something that, that, that requires this kind of patterned thinking rather than this checklist thinking. And if we don't have the right set of indicators, how do we know we're moving from brittleness to resilience? We might just be measuring increasing and better brittleness. So that's a, a challenge to, to think about. Um, now, all this is very heavy, and so what we found was, well, the way to do it is turn it into a game. You know, well, let's have fun with it. You know, we've gone through the gloom of it, now let's turn it into a creative adventure. So, um, one of the things we come up with is a world game, which is like a, um, a play in three acts. Um, we, we first of all explore the, the concerns in, in the, the areas that we've picked. We then play it looking at different futures that that might lead to. And then we create a, a, an in-the-round wisdom council using some of the indigenous people's wisdom methods to say, well, how do we see all this together? Um, and, and get a collective intelligence moving. And here's an example we did on saving cities. Um, we haven't yet got a customer, but you know, you never know. Um, uh, we got very close to it. Um, but this is the idea that we're looking at people taking responsibility for particular areas and then having this sort of cross-communication. So the things we need to bear in mind if we're going to change the way that we practice these things is keep revisiting the whole, develop this kind of holistic thinking and feeling, encourage self-organisation um, the, the, the people who are closest to the situation probably understand best how to deal with it. Um, but at the same time have multiple levels in mind because you can't deal with climate change at the level of what you're going to do um, in Glasgow city centre, although you can tr contribute to it in a small way. We talked a lot about connectedness, but the problem also we've got is that we're overconnected. You know, if, if it, it, take the financial situation where microseconds of trading go on and computers keep playing with each other and the whole thing, by the time any human being has caught up with what's going on, it's already moved on thousands of cycles. And so we actually create systems that have joined things up that shouldn't be joined up and we left disconnected things that need connecting. The other thing about complex systems is they're full of surprises anyway. Modern complexity science has shown that complex adaptive systems have emergent properties. So isn't it fun? We don't know what's going to come up next. So that's another reason for being resilient. And the other thing is that we are the designers. You know, the design isn't the system out there. We are in the system, part of it. 
and therefore our ethical integrity is also part of the system. And if it's lacking, then, well, we kind of know what we get. We get distancing and people can go around, go around bombing their own people. Um, so, to sum up, we've created a brittle society with massive, large-scale, unhealthy in interdependence. Um, it's increasingly vulnerable to synchronous failure. Um, making things safer in the old paradigm generally makes them increasingly unsafe. That's a scary one. Our short-term keep it safe, simple and cheap mentality inhibits the transformational vision. Or as a, another way of putting it is that we, we take the resilience premium as profit <coughs> in a capitalist society. It's false cheapness because it steals the resilience. And designing for transformational resilience within the planetary human limits is our best risk reduction policy and least costly for future generations. So can we get from here to here? So we need the answer to the question, is resilience enough? No, it isn't no, Graham. It depends what you mean. <laughs> we need transformative resilience. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. I feel like I've just taken a mark.